and grab your pen and paper because we're officially beginning session one. Here we go. Hey, Keto Campers, Ben Azadi here, best-selling author of Keto Flex, and I am live with you with the Keto Kickstart Challenge members. And I'm live streaming session one of all seven sessions uh, today for YouTube to see what we're doing today in session one. So that's what you're seeing here. I'm going to share the best tips for keto in 2023. So welcome. And here is the full schedule of the challenge in case you missed the live stream last Saturday. For the next seven days, starting today, we're going to go through these sessions. Today is this session, which is being live streamed on YouTube. Uh, Monday, that's today, January 9th, we just did our giveaway. I'm going to get right into the session very soon about how to start keto or break a keto stall. You're going to learn beginner and advanced strategies. Tomorrow, January 12th, we give away some prizes. And then we're going into session two, how to test for glucose and ketones, blood markers to get, the myths surrounding cholesterol and keto, and so much more. On Wednesday, we bring on the amazing Dr. Boz to talk about mastering your blood sugar, how ketones uncouple the mitochondria, how glucose and insulin destroy brain health, how to test A1C accurately, what that means, easy ways to test A1C. She has some great things she's going to share with you, followed by VIP Q&A. On Thursday, we bring on my mentor, Dr. Daniel Pampa and Dr. Mindy Pels together to talk about feast, famine, cycling, fast like a girl this process called hormesis. You'll learn about that on Friday. Oh, I have, I, I don't have the slide for Friday, but on Friday is session five, January 15th, where we're going to bring on some special guests to share their before and after um, experience. And then on Saturday, we're going to bring on Megan Ramos. Megan Ramos works closely with Dr. Jason Fung, and she's going to be sharing the best ways to reverse insulin resistance and diabetes. And VIP students could ask their questions as well. We take a break Sunday, Good time to rewatch the replays. And then we're back Monday, January 16th, not the 19th. That's the wrong date. Sorry about that. The 16th at 1150 AM, where we're going to get into keto flexing and autophagy versus mTOR uh, and so much more. So let's get into session one, which is right now. Here's where you're going to learn why keto is not a diet. Simple exchanges that simple keto exchanges that will transform your results why burning fat is much better than burning sugar, the history of ketosis, how ketones signal to the mitochondria to protect themselves. You're going to learn all about mitochondrial health, the best fats versus the worst fats to eat on keto, and much more. So if you're watching on YouTube, you do get, you do get access to this session one, but if you want access to all the other sessions for free, just go to ketocampchallenge.com. And for those of you in this challenge, share that link with your friend. It's still time. There's still time to get them in to this um, challenge. So let's start with this right here. 150,000. That is the amount of people that die on average every single day. Yesterday, 150,000 people fought and struggled for their last breath on planet Earth, and they lost that battle. Today, 150,000 people will lose that battle. That's the average of how many people die around the world every single day. I don't share that to start with doom and gloom. I share that because the fact that you're with me right now, everybody who's watching this right now, as long as you're not driving your car, put your hand over your heart, take a deep breath, exhale. You feel that heartbeat? That in itself is something to be grateful for. The fact that you are alive and your heart is beating is something to be grateful for. So let's start from a place of gratitude. And we are so blessed to be, even be alive and our next seven days is going to be quite the journey for you. I know I love this quote here. I'm going to get a little bit into some mindset because I believe mindset, by the way, is success is 95% mindset, 5% strategy. Neville Goddard said, we are only limited by weakness of attention and poverty of imagination. So when you think about the conscious mind versus the subconscious mind, it's the subconscious mind that's running the show. And we are distracted by social media, by news, by billboards, by propaganda. And we need to really do a good job of becoming aware of our thoughts and changing this programming that is running the show. Because you don't get what you want in life, you get what you are. And what you are is your subconscious mind, is your thoughts. So when you think about how this works from a scientific level, in case you're thinking, okay, Ben, you're getting a little woo-woo. Okay, let's talk about the science here. There's a part of your brain called the reticular activating system. 
That stands for RAS, Reticular Activation Activating System. So in the chat box, type in RAS, RAS. Make sure we're on the same page here. The RAS is the size of your pinky, and it's in your brainstem. And the job of the RAS is to filter out things that are not important. So I see your comments, Carol, Elizabeth, El Elaine, Sandy. The RAS is going to filter out anything that's too much that's not important. If you think about it, we are there's stimulation every day. Millions of things are stimulating the brain. And if we don't have a system, a filter to filter out what's not important, the brain would short circuit. So the reason now we have the RAS, the reason God put it in our brain is because it's going to filter out what's not important so we could focus on what is important. Here's how this works. You see this red Tesla here. Let's say your goal is to buy a red Tesla. You buy the red Tesla. Uh, before you actually buy it, you spend months researching red Teslas. You're on Auto Trader. You're on different car shopping websites. You're thinking about, should I buy a new one, a used one, a leased one? What's the best option? And you make the decision, I'm going to go buy that red Tesla. I've earned it. So you go to the dealership and you buy the red Tesla. You're so excited. You're driving off the lot with your red Tesla. Something happens where you notice red Teslas driving on the highway next to you. You notice red Teslas at the stop sign next to you, behind you. You start to notice red Teslas everywhere after you purchase your red Tesla. Now, did everybody end up buying a red Tesla because you bought one? Or were those red Teslas always there, but now you've activated the RAS to see it? Of course, it's the latter. You see, what you feed energy to expands. That is a universal law. So you've been, if you've been feeding energy to things that are not working for you, what, whatever self-limiting thoughts you have, I call it stinking thinking, you get more problems. If you focus on problems, you get more problems. That, that's how the RAS works. But if you focus on the opportunity you have with us in the next seven days to really learn and apply and change your life, if you focus on gratitude, abundance, you get more of that. That's the way it works. And a lot of people go into challenges, go into programs, start working with somebody, set goals, but they have the wrong expectations. And I'm a big believer in having the right expectations. So I'm going to share a quick story with you about the power of using expectation the right way. And this is going to be a share from the Bible about Moses, but it's not a religious share at all. I respect everybody's thoughts and feelings regarding religion and whether you believe in God or not. I definitely do believe in God. And I have a great relationship with God. And in the Bible, there's a story about Moses. And this, this story illustrates how important it is to expect great things in your life. Like, I want you to expect great things in the next seven days. I want to essentially change your consciousness. Moses changed the consciousness of his followers. And there's a story in the Bible of Moses walking through the desert with his followers. His goal was to change their consciousness their subconscious mind, essentially, their thoughts, their feelings, their actions, so they could be ready to enter a new land of abundance. That's what I want to do for you, essentially. I'm not comparing myself to Moses at all, but my goal is to take you to a new land of abundance and health. But here's the thing. With Moses, his followers had stinking thinking. You know, they were walking through the desert for hours, and there was no new land in sight. There was no food in sight. There was no water in sight. And his followers were starting to get frustrated and they were expecting bad things. They had stinking thinking. So they walk up to Moses and they're like, hey, Moses, do you know where you're going, dude? We're going to die out here. There's no new land like you promised. There's no water. There's no food. We're going to die. So Moses says, hey, pray to your God. Go pray to your God for rain. We'll collect that rain. We'll stay hydrated. So they go and they pray. Hours later, still no new land in sight, no water, no rain, no food. Now his followers are really pissed off and confused and stinking thinking is all over the place. So they all walk up to Moses. They say, Moses, you're lost. You don't know where you're going. God has forsaken us. We're going to die. Something interesting happened when they said that. Moses looked around behind their shoulders, looked around there, looked on the ground, and Moses said to them, where are the ditches? And they looked at Moses like, what do you mean ditches? And Moses said, if you truly expected rain, you would have dug the ditches to collect the rainwater. I don't see any ditches dug. 
You see, they weren't truly expecting it to rain because they would have dug the ditches. That is the power of expectation. So many people think they have to see it before they believe it, but it's the exact opposite. We believe it, then we see it. So as I take you on this seven-day journey, as I take you to a new land of health and abundance and gratitude and how to really optimize your health forever the right way, dig your ditches, prepare for it. Maybe that means you're a size 10 in your dresses and you want to go down to a size 6 as your goal and you're already buying size 6 dresses. You're digging your ditches. Maybe that's preparing, saving some money to eventually join our Keto Camp Academy, which, which we'll talk about because that's digging your ditches. I don't know what it is, but dig your ditches. Expect great things and great things will follow. Our environment determines our results. You become your environment. That is a fact because your environment determines your thoughts. Your thoughts determine your actions and your actions determine your results in life. But your environment controls that. And here's the thing. Whew, you're going to really resonate with this. You could probably, you probably went through this. When you change and you set goals and you start manifesting those goals and taking action with those goals. When you change, you become a threat to everybody in your life who does not change. Mm. So the story is like this. When we think about crabs, I don't know if you've heard this story about crabs in a bucket, but we have crabs in our life. You could put 30 crabs in a bucket without a lid and leave all 30 crabs overnight in that bucket without a lid. Come back the next morning, all 30 crabs are there. You might be thinking, how stupid are these crabs? They didn't try to escape. They had, there was no lid. They all could have broke free. Well, they did try to escape. Several crabs tried to escape. But anytime a crab saw another crab attempting to escape and break for freedom, it would claw at those crabs and drag it back down. You see, we have crabs in our life. We have people in our life, friends, family, coworkers who are crabs. And I'm not saying you're better than them or they're better than you. It's just that you have different goals and you're on a different level, a different frequency. It's just a different frequency. But we need to understand what's happening in our environment. So who are you spending your time with? If you're spending time with people who are going drinking each night, eating pizza and ice cream, it's going to be very difficult to make these changes because your environment has a huge influence on you. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to see this video here and see exactly the power of your environment, and then I'm going to give you a simple exercise to do. So check this out. Cleaning fleas requires a glass jar with a lid. The fleas are placed inside the jar, and the lid is then sealed. They are left undisturbed for three days. Then, when the jar is opened, the fleas will not jump out. In fact, the fleas will never jump higher than the level set by the lid. Their behavior is now set for the rest of their lives. And when these fleas reproduce, their offspring will automatically follow their example. Their offspring will automatically follow their example. Isn't that crazy? You know, their environment confined them to believe they were stuck, but not that just that their offspring had the same uh, subconscious DNA, et cetera. Like that's what our environment does to us. It's a powerful little video, isn't it? How the environment controls you. We don't want the environment to control us. We want to control the environment. So this is the exercise that I recommend everybody do. This is going to be a part of one of your action steps when I give you your homework assignment today. Do this exercise, okay? It's called, it's called chargers versus drainers. What you're going to do is today, when we're done with the session, you're going to grab a blank piece of paper. On that paper, you're going to draw a, a line down the middle, right down the middle of the, of the vertical line down the middle, and then a horizontal line at the top, kind of forming a cross. And on the top left of the paper, you're going to write the word chargers, chargers. Top right, you're going to write the word drainers. And then you're going to do an audit on the closest people in your life. It could be five people, 15 people, 30 people. And you're going to put them on different categories here. People that are chargers go on the left side. How do you know they're a charger? Here's how you know. We have a conversation with them. 
and you're charged up from that conversation. You're energized. They support you. They root you on. They really want you to hit those goals. Those people go on the left side. And then you think about the drainers, people that are gossiping, people that are bad influences, people that are saying, just live a little bit, eat the pizza, drink the beer. Why do you want all that? People who have stinking thinking, they gossip and you feel drained after you speak to them. Put them on the right. Now that right side is going to be a lot longer than the left side. But now that you've done the audit, you understand, okay, I'm going to spend more time with Erica here on the left, with Tony here on the left, with Michelle here on the left. And everybody on the right here, I'm not saying to get rid of them because it could be family members you put on that side who are drainers, but you spend less time with them. So who's going to do that exercise? Type in the chat box, I'm in, if you're going to do that exercise. Me and Alina and the Keto Cam coaches, Becky and John, are all going to be um, uh, chargers for you throughout this week. I see it, Trish. I see it, Elizabeth. I see it, Teresa, Tina, Angela, Julie. Let's go. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. Kathy. Yeah, I love it. Next thing to consider is that reasons come before results. You know, get clear on why you are embarking on your health goals. When the why is strong, the hows become easier. So please make sure. Hey, Tammy, good to see you. Please make sure you are clear on your why. When the why is strong, the how becomes easier. You know, when we think about what controls our actions, it's our thoughts. And I don't know if you knew this, but this is insane. The average person has upwards of 60,000 thoughts every single day. That's six zero thousand thoughts every single day. They did, they did studies on this. And in those studies, they determined that about 90% of those 60,000 thoughts, 90% of them every day are the same thoughts from yesterday. And about 85% of them are negative thoughts, stinking thinking. So the first thing I want you to write in your notes here, well, you probably put a few other things in your notes, but the next thing I want you to write in your notes is this. If you're thinking, it's thinking, your dreams are shrinking. You become what you think about most of the time. If you're thinking, it's thinking, your dreams are shrinking. Your thoughts actually have the ability, get this, and I'm going to show you this tomorrow when I'm going to draw some cells with you, but your thoughts have the ability to communicate with your DNA to produce proteins, either inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. So if you have 60,000 thoughts per day, that is 60,000 opportunities to put your body in a healing anti-inflammatory state. You are in control. I hope that inspires you. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you talk to yourself during the day? Put yes or no. Do you talk to yourself during the day? Type in yes or no. You know, when I ask this at lectures that I give all across the world, most people raise their hand, but there's still a small percentage that does not raise their hand. And I say, oh, so those who didn't raise your hand, you're thinking, do I talk to myself? I think I talk to myself. I might talk to myself. We all talk to ourselves. We all have conversations, but you are the most influential person you'll speak to today. Okay, you are the most influential person you'll speak to today. How's the conversation going? The truth is most people don't think. 2% of the population think, 3% of the population, they think they think, and 95% of the population would rather die than think. What do you mean by that, Ben? I think every single day. Well, here's the thing. Mental activity is not the same thing as creating original thoughts. I'm going to say that again. Mental activity is not the same thing as thinking. It's not the same thing as original thoughts. I'm going to give you a perfect example of what I mean and how we don't think. We're going to do an exercise here. And this is better when, we, when I do it in person, but it will still work here. Wherever you're watching this from, you might be at work, you might be walking, you might be at home. I still want you to participate here. I'm going to count to three. And at the count of three, we're going to all repeat the word silk five times out loud. And then I want you to answer a question in your head and or type it in. Let me know what you said as soon, what your answer was as soon as I asked the question. So on the count of three, I'm going to say silk five times, ask you a quick question, and you let me know in the chat box what your answer was. Be honest here. Okay, you ready? We're going to say silk five times. Silk, silk, silk. Ready? One, two, and three. Silk, 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 silk. What do cows drink? What was your answer? Silk, silk, silk. What do cows drink? What was your answer? 
Some of you are saying milk. Some of you are saying water. Some of you are saying milk, water, a good mix. They drink water, <laughs> but a lot of you said milk, right? So that's just a silly example to show you that we're not creating original thoughts. We're kind of going through the motion. Suzanne, you've seen me do that. So you're on top of it. So I, I see your comments here, right? Silly example to show you that we're not really creating original thoughts. There's one more thing. If there's a supplement you're going to take on keto or on any diet or any lifestyle, let it be vitamin G. Vitamin G is the world's most potent vitamin. Anti-inflammatory, fixes your hormones, upgrades keto, upgrades fasting. Dr. Joe Dispenza has done brain scans on individuals and he saw 1,200 different chemical reactions take place instantaneously that put the body in this healing anti-inflammatory state when they took vitamin G. Vitamin G is vitamin gratitude. The RIS I spoke about earlier, what you appreciate, it appreciates. What you feed energy to expands. Gratitude. Add gratitude into your list. It's one of the best supplements for longevity. You don't believe me? Check out this lady. I was on TikTok the other day. Sometimes TikTok reels me in. And this is a, a video I'm going to show to you right now of a 97-year-old who is asking her secrets to living a long, healthy life. And here is what she said. Like, how do you think you made it this many years? I don't know. I don't know. Because I'm naughty. I eat sugar. I eat butter. I eat things that I should not eat. And I have all my life. Well, what do you think is the secret? You know, people ask me and I tell them that you um, you pray a lot. You have faith. I do have faith, yes. I And I really spend... I, I, I cannot end my day without being grateful. I never take anything for granted. So that's, that's probably the secret. That's how you've lived to be 97. I don't because know. Because you never end your, your day without being grateful. I don't know. I really don't. That you have a lot of gratitude in your heart. Yes. What a beautiful lady. Oh my gosh. Vitamin G. It's a perfect example of how vitamin G works. Add it to your supplement list. Practice gratitude every day. Let me know in the chat box right now. What are you grateful for? What are you grateful for at this very moment? More on gratitude as we go through our challenge. You know, thoughts become things. Bob Proctor, my mentor who passed away last year, the great and late Bob Proctor said, thoughts become things. If you see it in your mind, you will hold it in your hand. Thank you, Shannon. Keto Camp Academy, I'm grateful for you. My faith, being alive, my health. I love all these comments. My family, Deb, I love it. You know, some of you know my story, some of you don't. So I'm just going to briefly share my backstory and why I am here with you today and why we're so committed here at Keto Camp to help you and help 1 billion people. For most of my life, I was obese. I grew up here in Miami Beach, Florida, where I currently live. And I followed a standard American diet, aka stupid American diet, really processed, unhealthy. I had a bad environment. I had bad stinking thinking. And I was depressed. I was suicidal. That is not an understatement. I do not use that word lightly. I was suicidal. This is a photo of me when I was 24 years old. I just went through a bad breakup. I was crying every single day and I was looking for ways to end my life. I explored suicide many times. And every time I explored suicide, I thought about my mom. I thought about the hurt and the devastation she would have to deal with and it stopped me. But I was really unhealthy physically unhealthy, mentally unhealthy. Here are some photos of me. Now I carried it very well. I'm six foot two, but this is me at 34% body fat, 250 pounds, physically obese, mentally obese, broken, broken, mentally bankrupt, addicted to soda and food. I had bad addictions to video games and sugar. And I knew my life was headed down a destructive path. But I also knew I was not going to take my life because I didn't want to do that to my mom. So what changed? This is what changed. A friend of mine handed me a book. And if you want to know what that book was called, it's a great book. It's called The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson. But one book led to five books. Five books led to 20 books. And when I started reading these books, it opened up a whole new world to me. I fell in love with authors like Dr. Wayne Dyer and Tony Robbins and Bob Proctor and 
Earl Nightingale and Zig Ziglar and Jim Rohn and Lisa Nichols and all these incredible authors. And the main thing these books did for me was help me take ownership and responsibility. You see, that word responsibility, it's your ability to respond to life. That is your responsibility. My ability to respond to life up until this point was poor. I blamed everybody. I was the victim. It's my slow metabolism, my enabling family members, my bad genetics. But when you become responsible and take ownership, you're no longer going to be the victim and you become the victor of your destiny and stop being the victim of your history. And that's what happened to me. So as we embark on the seven days, I want everybody in the chat box with me right now to type in all caps and several ex ex uh, exclamation points, I am responsible. Let's take responsibility together. I am responsible. Type it in the chat box. And I love Louise Hay too. I see your comments. I love it. Trish, Michelle, Robin, Deb, Vicky, Julie, let's go. Kelly, Eleanor, Patricia, Lauren. That's it. That's where your life changes in a second when you take responsibility. For me, this is what happened. I went from 250 pounds to 170 pounds. I lost 80 pounds of fat, 34% body fat to 6% body fat, size 38 waist to size 30. But the most important stat is the one at the bottom. I went from being mentally obese to carving out a mental six pack. And that is more important than a physical six pack any day of the week. And that's where it all changed for me. I've been in the health space since then, 14 years now, studying on average three hours every day for 14 years. And I, I don't say that to impress you. I say it to impress upon you. I've learned a lot and I continue to learn. My goal is to teach this to you this week. So that's where it changed. But the real reason I'm with you today is because of my dad. My dad's name is Cyrus Azadi. Here's a photo of me and my father. You see, my parents immigrated to the United States from Iran. They were born in Iran. My dad had a, a job opportunity in Miami Beach. He took it, brought my mom, and then I was born here in Miami, 1984. So my dad followed a standard American diet, and my dad developed type 2 diabetes. You might have type 2 diabetes, or you might know somebody with type 2 diabetes. I never really understood type 2 diabetes. I just remember my dad taking his medication, and then when I was an adult, I would take him to his doctor's appointments and listen to his doctor's. They would say he needs to take this amount of insulin, this amount of these meds. He needs to eat these foods. And I listened to them. I, I listened to them to a T. And my dad gained weight over the even more weight. His diabetes got worse and it kept progressing. And something happened in November of 2013. In November of 2013, I got a phone call from my dad. And my dad was telling me that he had really bad diabetic neuropathy where he couldn't even walk to the restroom. Diabetic neuropathy is where the nerves in your extremities and your feet are inflamed and degenerate, degenerating, degenerating, and you cannot get blood flow, and it's really painful, and his really progressed. So me and my mom picked up my dad. We rushed him to Mount Sinai Medical Center here in Miami Beach, Florida, and in the hospital, in the emergency room, they got my dad a room, started running tests on him. And my dad was really stressed out because the next step is amputation. There are tens and tens of thousands of amputations that take place every year in the United States because of type 2 diabetes. My dad knew that this might be his near future. And in the hospital, in the emergency room, my dad suffered a massive stroke, which left him paralyzed on the entire right side of his body. And he lost the ability to speak. And I would visit my dad. They transferred him to hospice. And I would visit my dad in hospice care every week, two to three times a week for months. And every time I went into the room, he was in bad shape. He couldn't even speak to me. But I would be there playing music, consoling him, talking to him, loving on him. And it was a very difficult time in my life. Nine months into this, it was August 11th, 2014, Monday night. I walk into the hospice room and I prepare myself because... If you've ever been to a hospice, it is so soul sucking, but I didn't want to show up all negative. I didn't want to show up with a sad face. I wanted to show up for my dad like I had been doing. So I put on this facade, if you want to call it that. I walk into the room and 
What do I see? My dad is convulsing. He's shaking. He's throwing up on himself. And I immediately ran into the hallway. I flagged down as many people as I can who work there. The nurses, the doctors, they rush into the room. They started cleaning my dad up and running some tests on him and consoling him. And a couple hours later, he was better. He, he was no longer throwing, on him, throwing up on himself. And I remember looking at my dad and this is one of the first times I've ever seen my dad cry in my entire life. And he was crying. He couldn't even say a word, but I could see the, the pain and the suffering in his eyes. And I remember walking up to my dad that night, giving him a kiss on the forehead, looking at him directly in the eyes and telling him how much I loved him, telling him how much he's meant to me and how he's always going to be my dad no matter what. I'm always going to be his son no matter what. And I kissed him again on the forehead and I, and I said the words, hasta la vista, baby. And I said those words because my dad always said those words when he said bye to me from the movie Terminator, which I loved as a kid. He loved it too. We used to watch it together. So I said those words to my dad that night, hasta la vista, baby. And then I drove home that night crying in the car, got home that night, cried at home, and I prayed that night. And I said the same prayer that I would say every single night, which was, God, please end my father's suffering. He has suffered enough. Please end my father's suffering. He suffered enough. I'm, I was so tired of seeing him in pain. And there was something different about this prayer. There was a feeling, there was an energy, there was something that was different. And I went to bed. The next day I wake up, which was Tuesday morning, August 14th, 2014. I go about my day and then around noon, I see my phone is ringing and I look at my phone and I see the caller ID and it's the hospice calling me. And as soon as I saw that, my heart just sinks in my chest. I knew something was wrong. So I pick up the phone and it's the nurse letting me know that my dad passed away that morning. And I remember hanging up the phone, sitting on my couch, my dog Ziggy staring at me, just bawling, just crying. If you've ever lost a loved one, you know exactly how I feel, how I felt. You know, a part of me was relieved. A part of me was like, oh, thank God, I no longer have to see my dad in such pain. He's no longer in pain. He's, he's, he's in peace now. But the majority of me was so devastated, so angry, so sad, pissed off that I lost my dad. And it raised so many questions for me. Why did my dad have to suffer so much when I followed the doctor's advice, conventional doctors? Why are so many people sick and unhealthy in the world? And it opened up a lot of avenues for me because I found the answers. And I'm going to share with you the answers. As a matter of fact, the same information I'm going to share with you today and throughout our seven-day sessions here same information I share on stages all across the world, in my books, on my podcast. It's the same information that would have saved my father. He, he, I believe he would still be alive today if I would have applied what I'm about to teach you today and this week. I get that. I know that. I understand that. But I also know this. I was given that mountain so I could show the world that this mountain can be moved. Up until that point, I was treating this like a hobby. And then out of the pain came the purpose. Out of the purpose came the promise. And the promise is this, to educate and to inspire 1 billion people on planet Earth because we have the tools. We have the solution. And I encourage you to lean in. I encourage you to share this information with your family because this is the information that's going to actually reverse disease or prevent disease. Unfortunately, I had to go through that pain for it to become really my purpose. And sometimes you've gone through a pain that's revealed your purpose. But I, I know this, too many of us, too many of people we love, too many friends and family, too many people are going through the motions. They're treating their health casually. And if you treat your health casually, you will end up a casualty. You will be another statistic. And I don't want that for you. I don't want that for your friends. I don't want that for your family members. I don't want that for any human being. God built us so magnificently, we don't have to suffer. We don't have to barely survive. 
we have the ability to thrive. You watching this right now, I want you to understand something very important. You are a masterpiece because you are a piece of the master and God has built your body or the universe or mother nature, whatever that word you want to use, higher power has built your body to be self healing. We just got to do three things. Write these down. Number one, identify the interference. What is interfering with the innate intelligence? What is interfering with the human body? Number two, work on removing the interference. And number three, you just allow your incredible body to heal itself. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So that's why I'm with you because of my dad to honor him. And I know that's you can resonate, especially if you lost somebody. So now I am the founder of Keto Camp. If we're just meeting today, we are the leading source in the world on keto and fasting. Our mission is to educate and to inspire 1 billion people. I have four best selling books. I'm a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner. I work with about 47 doctors, including Dr. Mindy Pels, Dr. Pampa, and many others. I have written four books, all ranked worldwide perfect health booklet, intermittent fasting cheat sheet, the power of sleep, and my latest book, Keto Flex. KetoFlex has been endorsed by Dr. Bickman, Cynthia Thurlow, Dr. Fung, Dr. Mindy, Megan Ramos, and many, many other leaders in the space. I get to speak on stages and panels all across the world. I'm speaking at several stages this year. I hope to see you there. And I love it. You know, we have a great community on YouTube with over 100,000 subscribers. And that's what we do. So if we're just meeting, it's so great to meet you. Now, when we talk about keto, there's a lot of confusion. I'm sure you can relate. You go on Dr. Google and type in a simple search term like what is the keto diet, you're going to get over 100 million results. And not all keto approaches are created equal. Uh, I'm going to share something shocking with you, but I would say 90% of the people who do keto and teach keto do not do it the right way. The way we teach keto is very different. You're going to learn why. But my job is to clear out all the confusion for you. And that's what we're going to be doing throughout the next seven days. So let me ask you this. For those of you watching, uh, are you new to keto? Type in new. Uh, Have you been doing keto for six months? Type in how long you've been doing it for, maybe a few years. Want to get an understanding on how long or who's a beginner here, who's somebody who's been doing it for quite some time. So type in the chat box. The truth about keto is this. It's not a diet. And I see there's a lot of new, new people here. Awesome. Five years plus Elizabeth, three years, four years. Keto is not a diet. Keto is a metabolic process. The truth of the matter is that keto has been around for as long as humans have existed. When your friends tell you, oh, you're doing that keto thing, that's just a new fad diet. Actually, it's not a fad. It's a fact. It's a metabolic process. Every single one of your ancestors did keto. That's a fact. How do I know? Because they didn't have food available all the time, so they had to tap into ketosis. The fact that the body has this ability to produce ketones is why we actually live today. Meaning our ancestors, when they did not have food available, or if they just had protein and fat and no carbs, naturally they drop, they drop um, glucose in the body and brain and they have to burn fat and fat then is going to the liver and the liver produces ketones, which gives them a different fuel source so the brain can function. Otherwise they would become blubbering idiots and they wouldn't have been able to hunt and kill and stay focused. They would have died. So the reason we exist today is because of ketosis. Thank God for ketones. So your friends who don't understand that, educate them on that. It's not a diet. It's a metabolic process. It just might be new to somebody, but it's not new. We know that it's a very powerful fuel for the entire human body. I'm going to go over some studies. And the main thing is like what Dr. Pompa said, his quote, you're going to meet him on Thursday session four. If you don't fix, if you want to get well, you got to fix the cell. So let's talk about that. First, I want to go over some stats here. I'm just going to lower my desk and sit down because my back is aching from basketball. So bear with me here. But we think about the sickening stats out there. I'm going to cover a few. And these are stats according to the CDC and cancer.org. So I'm just sitting down here. Thanks for bearing with me. One out of three women are diagnosed with cancer within their lifetime. For men, it's one in two. It's estimated that 60% of Americans are diabetic or pre-diabetic. And they're estimating by the year 2032, which is not too far away, 
one in two children will be born on the autism spectrum. Harvard put out this article and they're estimating by the year 2030, 50%, close to 50% of the American population will be classified as obese. So the question is this, why is disease on the rise? Well, for example, if you've ever been to a hospital, this is the food they give hospital patients. Meaning if somebody who has cancer and they're going through chemotherapy to get treatment for their cancer, in their hospital bed, they're given food that's processed and inflammatory that contributes to cancer growth. How ridiculous is that? Why do they even allow fast food restaurants in hospitals, McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's? You've seen it. Doctors take break from treating patients to go eat fast food. Patients take break, breaks from getting treatment to go eat fast food. Why do they allow it? It's sick care. You know, human beings are the only species smart enough to create their own food and dumb enough to actually eat it. The sad truth is that a cured patient is a lost customer. So when we think about symptoms versus root cause, symptoms are usually far removed from the root cause. And I'm going to give you a paradigm shift here on symptoms. We've been taught to believe that disease and symptoms are evil. But actually, there's something really beautiful about disease and symptoms. Let me explain what I mean. Imagine this scenario. Let's say somebody ate an entire pizza last night. She ate an entire pineapple, two slices of cheesecake, spaghetti and meatballs, 200 prunes, 50 strawberries, a pound of cheese. And she's like, hey, I want to throw in some healthy gut bacteria. I'm going to throw in two cups of sauerkraut. Well, she wakes up this morning with a lot of symptoms. She is bloated. She is puffy. She has acid reflux. She has severe diarrhea. So what does she do with all those symptoms? She makes an appointment with her conventional doctor. And she says, doc, I'm dealing with all of these symptoms. And she lists them all. And the doctor says, oh, I'm listening. Okay, cool. No worries. Here is a prescription I'm going to write for you for an antacid, anti-flatulence, and five other medications. Now, were those symptoms the problem or were they feedback mechanisms to her? What if the doctor would have just said, hey, what did you eat? Oh, you ate all that? That's the cause. Don't eat that again. Instead of writing five prescriptions and getting some sort of bonus for meeting her quota for the month of writing prescriptions. Symptoms are a gift. Disease is a gift. I know it's, it's crazy for me to say that, but understand that this is your body's check engine light. If you were driving on a seven hour road trip and two hours into it on the highway, your check engine light turned on, would you just ignore it and cover it up and keep driving? Well, if you did, you're in for some trouble. But thank God that car has an intelligence in it to show you something's wrong with the engine so you could stop the car pull it over, pop open the hood, and figure out what's going on in that vehicle. Your body has a check engine light too, and that is manifesting as symptoms. What are symptoms? Brain fog, cancer, diabetes, insulin resistance, and thousands of other symptoms. Symptoms are not your problem. A diagnosis is not your problem. They are your body's check engine light. How long has your body's check engine light been on, turned on. We're going to get to the cause. We're going to use keto, intermittent fasting, keto flexing to get to the cause so we could figure out what the interference is, remove it, and allow your magnificent body to heal itself. So don't hate your symptoms. Be thankful for them. It means your body's out of homeostasis. It means there's interference. Let's find out why. This goes to Alina's quick tip of the day earlier. If you missed it, watch the replay. I love this quote. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and then relearn. Einstein said, intellectuals solve problems, geniuses prevent them. You're all geniuses. We want to be proactive, not reactive. I've come to find that there's two types of people out there. On the left side, there are 97 percenters. 97% of the population's are looking for toxic pills, fad diets, surgeries, and quick weight loss gimmicks. They officially, excuse me, they are 
dead at 25 years old, but they don't make it official till they're 75 years old. They're going through the motions. They're unhappy. They're unhealthy. They're drainers. Instead of living 75 years, they live one year 75 times. But then we have the three percenters. Three percenters understand it's a lifestyle change. Three percenters understand it's cause and effect. Three percenters do not chase symptoms. A three percenter gets diagnosed with a terminal illness. The doctor says, hey, sorry to tell you, you have stage four cancer and you have four months to live. But a three percenter looks at their doctor and says, who are you to play God? I am not terminal. Your ability to help me is terminal. And they go on to heal themselves. A three percenter does whatever it takes to get to the cause. They are committed. They understand it's not about a fad diet. It's about a lifestyle change. I want you to be honest with me. Put in the chat box, who are you? Which side of this line are you on? Are you on the left side looking to change or are you committed to be a three percenter? Heidi's a three percenter. Christine is a three percenter. Deborah's a th Deborah's a three percenter. Gail, I know you're a three percenter. Elizabeth, I know you're a three percenter. Stephanie, I know you're a three percenter. I love it because here's the truth: this challenge will only help those on the right side, three percenters. We cannot help those on the left side. So if you're looking for a shortcut, if you're looking for a fad diet, a quick weight loss uh, approach, this challenge is not for you. And I will not be offended if you just sign off and don't attend any more of the sessions. But if you're looking for a lifestyle change, something that's going to be permanent, this is the right place for you. So we think about the human body. There is something called the innate intelligence. The innate intelligence is the wisdom inside of your human body. There is an intelligence inside of your human body. For years, scientists believe that your intelligence was your DNA nucleus, meaning if you have cancer, or excuse me, if family, if cancer runs in your family, you got those genes just a matter of time. If heart disease or high blood pressure is in your family, it's just a matter of time. So it's more of a victim mentality of your gen genes determine your destiny. There was a guy that came on the scene named Dr. Bruce Lipton. He's a world-renowned cell biologist. And Dr. Bruce Lipton, I brought him on my Keto Camp podcast before. Go listen to it. It's a great episode. And he wanted to challenge the notion that your genes are not where the intelligence is. Something controls your genes. So what he did is he would remove the DNA nucleus from cells and observe what happened next. And to his amazement, the cell went on to function just fine, even without the DNA nucleus for months. So then he wanted to find out, all right, if it's not the DNA that's running the show, what's controlling the cell? What, where is the intelligence? So what happens is he removed the cell membrane, which is this lipid bilayer around the cell, instant death. Because it's the cell membrane that controls the show. And I'm going to draw the cell with you tomorrow. So you don't want to miss session two because we're going to go deeper into this. But the cell membrane, he calls the cell membrane, the intelligence. Every cell has these receptor sites. They're called integral membrane proteins, IMPs, aka receptor sites. Hormones, nutrients, thoughts, oxygen connect to it, and then it communicates to your DNA. Your DNA could turn on genes, your DNA could turn off genes. This is called epigenetics. Dr. Bruce Lipton believes that 99% of all disease and all symptoms is epigenetics. Only 1% is strictly your genes. Let me go a little bit deeper into this because I really want you to understand this. There was a study that came out um, called Obesity Epigen Epigenetics and Gene Regulation. Of two identical, genetically identical mice, how can one be small and another fat? Research on epigenetic changes resulting from the environment can give us clues into obesity in mice and humans. And the study showed this. One suspected trigger is a chemical in a plastic drink bottle called BPA, including baby bottles, unfortunately. BPA, it's a toxic toxin. In this one particular notable study, scientist Randall Jertle and his group of researchers exposed the pregnant mice to BPA and watched as more of their genetically identical progeny developed into yellow obese mice that would normally be expected in Jertle's experiment. DNA methylation, which is like the gears and switches and how your, your genes function and cells function, at the agouti gene site was decreased 31%. So let me share this with you. 
and show you exactly how epigenetics works. And then we're going to get into the mitochondria and then how keto helps with this whole process. So check this out. Let me share this with you. This is a very fascinating video that's going to show you exactly how epigenetics works. If I could find, oops, sorry about that. Uh, here we go. Well, these mice may hold a clue. Their DNA is as identical as Anna Marie and Clotilde's, despite the differences in their color and size. The human who studies them is Duke University's Randy Jurdle. So Randy, I see here you have skinny mice and fat mice. What have you done in this lab? Well, these animals are actually genetically identical. The fat ones and the skinny one. That's correct. Because these are huge. They're huge. Uh, can we weigh them to find sure. out? So if you take, this is... Looks I'm like not, they can barely walk. They, they didn't, can't walk too much. They're not going to be running very far. So that's so about 63 grams. 63 grams. Let's look at the other one. So it's half the weight. Right. This gets even more mysterious when you realize that these identical mice both have a particular gene called agouti. But in the yellow mouse, it stays on all the time, causing obesity. <laughs> Just look at this. So what accounts for the thin mouse? Exercise? Atkins? No. A tiny chemical tag of carbon and hydrogen, called a methyl group, has affixed to the agouti gene, shutting it down. Living creatures possess millions of tags like these. Some, like methyl groups, attach to genes directly, inhibiting their function. Other types grab the proteins, called histones, around which genes coil, and tighten or loosen them to control gene expression. Distinct methylation and histone patterns exist in every cell, constituting a sort of second genome, the epigenome. Epigenetics literally translates into just meaning above the genome. So if you would think, for example, of the genome as being like a computer, the hardware of, the, of, of a computer, the epigenome would be like the software that tells the computer when to work, how to work, and how much. That's exactly how epigenetics works. So we think about your genes, it's not the genes you're born with that's the problem, meaning, yeah, genes load the gun, but you have control whether or not you want to pull the trigger. And that's how epigenetics works. So we think about it. It's like genes are like a Christmas tree. They turn on, they turn off. If you have symptoms or you've been diagnosed with some sort of autoimmune or whatever it is, it was a gene that was turned on. And if you turned it on, you could turn it off like a Christmas tree. And we're going to talk about that. I hope you're excited. So how it works is this. There's an environmental stimulus that binds to the cell membrane and then a chemical reaction inside of the cell reaches the DNA and then a gene becomes expressed. Now, if that environmental stimulus is an inflammatory one, the gene expressed is a inflammatory protein. But if it's an anti-inflammatory, the gene expressed is anti-inflammatory. This is how it works. Epigenetics rules 99% control. It all boils down really to the mitochondria. You might've heard of the mitochondria. This is one. So it's called the mitochondrion. The mitochondria are very important to understand. And I'm going to go over this. Let me ask you this question before I go over it. Quiz time. Which cells inside of your body have the highest concentration of mitochondria? Let me see your answers. Which cells inside of your body have the highest concentration of mitochondria? You're going to be blown away when I go over how ketones help your mitochondria get strong. Okay, I see Kelly says brain. Nancy says fat cells. Elaine says brain. Vicky says muscle. Cindy says muscle. Br Brian says brain. Gloria says brain. Y'all are smart. Yeah, so first, before I give you the answer, think about this. The mitochondria are so important that the cells that are most needed for survival have the most mitochondria in them. For example, most cells have hundreds to a few thousand mitochondria in one cell, but the brain 
has 2.5 million mitochondria in a single cell in different regions of the brain. The eyeballs are also loaded with mitochondria. The heart loaded with thousands and tens of thousands of mitochondria. The ovaries loaded with mitochondria. What do they all have in common? They're all needed for survival. Put this down in your notes. This is a very important takeaway. The number one priority for the human body is survival. The number one priority for the human body, the innate intelligence, is survival. So God put mitochondria in the cells that are most needed for survival. That's how important the mitochondria are. So what do the mitochondria do? Well, we know that most diseases are linked to mitochondrial dysfunction. If the mitochondria are not working properly, there's going to be disease. And here's a list of the most common diseases linked to mitochondrial dysfunction. I'm not going to read all of these, but you can see diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune disease, liver failure, cancer, obesity. It's all a result of the mitochondria not functioning well. This is called mitochondrial dysfunction. Now, you're, the basic understanding of mitochondria that you might have learned in biology class is that it's, a, it's an energy factory. And that is true. It is an energy factory. It takes fuel sources, glucose, ketones, fatty acids, aminos, and it produces energy. That energy is called ATP. So think of the mitochondria as the factory, the energy factory, and think of ATP as your energy currency. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. But there's a dual role to the mitochondria. The mitochondria also act as a surveillance system. There's actually intelligence in your mitochondria. And this is new research from Robert Navio, Dr. Robert Navio. And these mitochondria are acting as surveillance systems to threats, cellular threats. And if there's too much stress, too much cellular threats, it goes into the cell danger response. The cell danger response is when the mitochondria will lower energy production in order to survive. Long COVID symptoms is a CDR response. Autoimmune disease and obesity is a CDR response. Diabetes is a CDR response. So when you think about the mitochondria and the cell danger response, mitochondria are well known for the production of cellular energy. The cellular danger views a dual role of the mitochondria as energy sensors and cell defense agents under CDR. The mitochondria turn down energy production and increase oxidative activity, which is inflammation. A healthy cell produces optimal amount of energy for homeostasis and buffers oxidative stress, but a CDR cell is going to produce a lot of oxidative stress. So when you feel fatigued and inflamed, it's actually a purposeful response from your mitochondria to protect cells and protect tissues from the body due to infections, toxins, and trauma and chemicals. So I'll show you an example of what a healthy mitochondria looks like versus an unhealthy mitochondria. A healthy mitochondria produces few free radicals, produces a lot of energy. A unhealthy mitochondria produces little energy and a lot of inflammation. It's estimated by the age 70, 70% 70 of mitochondria is damaged or lost. This brings me to ketosis. Which option is going to be better for your mitochondria. Which option on the screen is going to get you farther? On the left, we see glucose, which is this beat up, banged up car, not very efficient. On the right, we see this nice, beautiful car we'll call ketones. Well, I say that because check out the difference in energy production with glucose versus ketones. A molecule of glucose produces, the mitochondria will produce about 32 to 36 ATP from a molecule of glucose. Compare that to a molecule of ketones, you get 400% more energy, 120 to 160. So a lot more energy. That's why so many people, when they do keto right, they feel so good. They feel like it's a superpower. I call it the great land of ketosis. And that's because when you're in ketosis, ketones are signaling molecules that tell the mitochondria to make more of themselves. And at the same time, it lowers inflammation. When a cell is not in ketosis, when the mitochondria are burning glucose, it creates a lot of free radicals. And it's like having one firefighter that has to put out an entire building that's on fire. It's not going to be able to keep up with it. That's why when you're burning sugar, it ages you fast. But when you're in ketosis, ketones protect your mitochondria. It's like having a 
firefighter on call 24 seven to put out any fires. That's why when you see all these studies on ketosis, it shows how it's so great for inflammation. This study showed ketones inhibit mitochondrial production of reactive oxygen species, which is inflammation production following glutamate excitotoxicity by increasing NADH oxidation. There's a study down there if you want to check that out. This study is showing that ketones and a stress response helps redox homeostasis, just helping your cells reach balance. This study was duplicated. It was done by UC Davis in some metabolism and then duplicated by the Buck Institute in some metabolism. And it showed that the ketogenic diet increased lifespan in mice. Pretty cool. This study showed that suppression of oxidative stress by beta hydroxybutyrate, which is one of the three ketones, helped endogenous histone deacetylase inhibitor. This study showed what ketones does for the heart. So if you have friends saying ketones are going to create heart disease and blah, 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 whatever, stinking, thinking nonsense, look at this. Share this study with them. You, you see the study right there. Take a screenshot. Here's what the study showed. Evidence from both experimental and clinical research has uncovered a protective role for ketones in cardiovascular disease. Although ketones may provide supplemental fuel for the energy-starved heart, their cardiovascular effects appear to extend far beyond cardiac energetics. Indeed, ketone bodies have been shown to influence a variety of cellular processes, including gene transcription, inflammation, and oxidative stress, endothelial function, cardiac remodeling, and cardiovascular risk factors. Cindy, I will go over all those three ketones tomorrow with you. Ketones also do something called mitochondrial uncoupling. And when we bring on Dr. Boz on Wednesday, she'll give you a masterclass on this, but I'll give you a quick analogy to kind of lay the framework for Dr. Boz to explain this more on Wednesday. Uh, Dr. Stephen Gundry shared this on my Keto Camp podcast when I interviewed him. Think of this pressure cooker. You know, if you've ever used a pressure cooker, you understand that there's all this steam that builds up in a pressure cooker, but every pressure cooker has a release valve that gets rid of excess steam. This is kind of what's happening when your cells are, when your mitochondria are producing ketones and communicating with ketones. They get rid of these extra free radicals. So you have a situation when keto is done right, you have a situation where your cells are producing more energy and less inflammation. I will call that the biggest win-win you could ever do. More energy, less inflammation, sign me up. But it has to be done right. We're going to talk about that throughout the next seven days. So who do you want protecting your cells? McLovin from Superbad, which we'll call glucose, or the secret service, which we'll call ketones. That's why when you're burning sugar, it's like a truck with all the smoke, and then ketones are more of a natural source of energy. I love this quote from Henderson back in 2008. Ketones are high octane brain fuel. Throughout much of human evolution, ketosis likely served as a valuable survival mechanism to fuel brain metabolism during times of food scarcity. Hence, in some ways, the modern diet can be considered keto deficient. Keto deficient. As a matter of fact, let me share something real quick. There was a study that came out. Get this, this study was crazy. Uh, I thought I had it in my slides, but I know the study top of my mind. This study was done by the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill in 2018. In this study, they wanted to determine, it was a 10-year study with over 8,000 participants. Their goal was to determine how healthy or how unhealthy is the adult American population. And at the end of this 10-year study, they concluded, and by the way, before what they concluded, they looked at different health metrics, blood pressure, BMI, fasting glucose, medication, how many medication, are you taking medication, um, insulin, and different health metrics. And at the end of the study, they determined that 88% of American adults are metabolically unhealthy. Only 12% of us are metabolically healthy. And that was before COVID. You know that got worse after COVID. So I would say this, 88% of American adults are in a keto deficiency. That's the real problem. They really need this process called ketosis. There's nothing new about keto. I mentioned you're born into ketosis. Babies that are breastfed 
actually go in and out of ketosis because breast milk has saturated fat and cholesterol, which helps the development of the baby's brain. The brain is mostly fat. Those are three PubMed studies that verify that. So what do you do if keto is not working for you? This is going to be a very important part, whether you're new to keto or not. Check this out. I interviewed, here's a friend of mine, Dr. Kate Shanahan, medical doctor. How many of you know Dr. Kate? She was the nutritionist for the Los Angeles Lakers when Kobe Bryant used to play. She has an amazing book called Deep Nutrition. I have it somewhere on my desk here. And I've interviewed her on my Keto Camp podcast several times. I asked her this question. I said, Dr. K. Shanahan, three scenarios. Which scenario is worse? Scenario number one, somebody smokes cigarettes every single day. Scenario number two, somebody eats processed sugar every single day. Scenario number three, somebody eats vegetable oils every single day. Which one is worse? You know what she said? That's an easy question. And she laughed a little bit. She said, it's the vegetable oils. She said, yeah, cigarette smoking is not good for you. But once you finish the last puff, the damage is done. She said, processed sugar is not good for you, but you could burn off excess sugar with exercise. But she said, these seed oils called linoleic acid, these seed oils, the half-life, meaning if you remove them today, half of them will remain in your body fat for two years. They are highly inflammatory. They gunk up your cells. They create free radicals and destroy your mitochondria, and they live in your body for years. It's estimated that it's 680 days before half of them will remain in your body. So what are they? Before I share them with you, one of them is called canola oil. And if you haven't seen this video, go on YouTube and watch how canola oil is made. But I'm going to show you the video right now. Check this out. And then I'll give you a list of the eight you want to avoid. Here you go. A conveyor then feeds the flakes into a screw press. It has a large revolving screw-shaped shaft enclosed within a slotted cage. As the shaft turns, its threads squeeze the flakes with high pressure, forcing out the oil, which then drains out through the slots. 42% of canola seed is oil. This screw press extracts nearly three quarters of that. The remainder is still trapped in the pressed flakes, now referred to as canola cake. The cake exits the other end of the press and moves on to a second extraction. This one, a 70-minute wash with a solvent. This chemical extraction process removes all but a trace of oil. The factory then grinds the cake into protein-rich meal, which it sells as animal feed. The extracted oil, stored in large tanks, now enters the refining phase. First, they wash the oil for 20 minutes with sodium hydroxide. During this wash cycle, they spin the oil at high speed so that the centrifugal force separates the natural impurities, which the factory later sells to soap manufacturers. After this cleaning process, the canola oil is visibly clearer. However, it still contains natural waxes, which make it look cloudy. So the next step is to cool the oil to 5 degrees Celsius. This thickens those waxes so they can be filtered out. The waxes don't go to waste either. The factory uses them to produce vegetable shortening. In the factory's lab, Technicians recreate production on a small scale to ensure performance and quality. Meanwhile, back in the factory, after washing and filtering the oil, they bleach it to lighten the color. Then you they bleach it to lighten the color. How nice of them. How disgusting is that? Oh my gosh. That's just one of the eight that I'm going to show you right now. They are highly unstable. Let me just share with you. I'm going to share with you the science in a second. Let me go over the eight. Let me go over the science and then I'll go over the eight. So they're called polyunsaturated fatty acids. PUFAs. And I, I really want you to understand this. I'm going to, I'm going to explain it with you. Then I'll read the study. Polyunsaturated fatty acids. So there's different types of fats and they define the fat. And I see your comments. Yuck, disgusting, terrible. Kristen's a chef and that's gross. Yeah. They define they call a fat 
a certain name based off of the chemical structure. So for example, saturated fat, monounsaturated fats, and polyunsaturated fats, and trans fats are four different classifications. These vegetable oils, seed oils, linoleic acid, same thing, they're classified as polyunsaturated fatty acids. So I'm going to call them PUFAs for short. Dr. K always says PUFAs go poof. They oxidize. Here's why. The chemical structure of PUFAs, the word poly means many. So there's many double bonds in the chemical structure of these fats. The more double bonds that are closely connected to each other, the more aggressive it attracts oxygen. The more aggressive it attracts oxygen, the more it oxidizes. What does that mean? If I bit into an apple right here in front of you, took a bite of the apple, left it on my desk, came back in five hours and looked at the apple, you'll see it turns brown. That's oxidation. Those oils are doing the same thing to your cells and to your mitochondria. They're highly unstable. You just saw how they process them. They use a whole bunch of chemical bleaching and other chemicals and it's hot processed at high heat and then we cook them and then it's even more heat. I remember this. <laughs> you might not know this, but my mom worked at Kentucky Fried Chicken when I was a kid. That was part of my story. She would bring me Kentucky Fried Chicken and she would tell me that she only brought Kentucky Fried Chicken on the day they changed the oils. She told me, and they still do this to this day, they don't change the oils for 14 days. So they fry in canola, soybean, vegetable oils over and over and over at high temperatures for 14 days before it turns so black that they change it out. Like, are you kidding me? And, and people are, are buying this? I mean, I did it myself. It's disgusting. So here's some research to back up why it is so inflammatory. This study is showing that dietary PUFAs and cancer of breast and colon cancer are connected. So here's what it said. Persistent oxidative stress often involving the enhanced peroxidation of PUFAs in the membrane are known to enhance the development of malignant diseases. Thus, the carcinogenic, which means cancer-causing process, can be initiated and or accelerated by lipid peroxidation-induced DNA and protein damage. This study showed that linoleic acid, which is the PUFA, increases endothelial dysfunction and inflammatory marker expression. It also showed that diabetics have more linoleic acid in their LDL particles versus non-diabetics. This study showed that corn oil induces changes to cardiac fatty acids and causes early diastolic dysfunction without altering systolic function. This is a cool study looking at how the mitochondria uses different fats and it essentially said the mitochondria cannot use PUFAs for energy production anywhere near the way it can use it for monounsaturated fats and saturated fats. So PUFAs equal cell death. This is a chart showing you the different oils which contain the most amount of linoleic acid. Now keep this in mind. Linoleic acid is not bad unless it's processed. So there's a big difference between processed omega-6 and unprocessed, Okay. I want to make that clarification, but here's the reality. Most seed oils are going to be processed. So that's why I classify them as all being bad, but they're called adultered oils, but there's also unadulterated, but it's hard to find those. There's some resources, which I'll go over, but this is the list. Let me go over the list list with you. Here you go. Write them down. Take a screenshot. Here are the hateful eight canola oil. Corn oil, also called rapeseed if you live in the UK. Soybean oil, cottonseed oil, safflower oil, peanut oil, sunflower oil, grapeseed oil. Fish oil is also PUFA and inflammatory and rice bran oil. Now there's a few on here. Let's safflower oil and sunflower oil and grapeseed oil could actually be healthy for you if it's processed the right way. So don't forget that. But most of the time it's not processed the right way. If you're looking for grapeseed oil, and safflower or sunflower oil, it needs to be organic, cold pressed, and then it's totally safe. It could be healthy for you, but most of the time they're not. Switch them, swap them, replace them for saturated and monounsaturated fats like the following. Real olive oil that's not cut, real avocado oil that's not cut, grass-fed butter, grass-fed ghee, duck fat, lard from you know healthy organic cow, uh, pig, excuse me, co coconut oil, and beef tallow. 
you're thinking, Ben, how I thought fish oil was good for you. I'm here to tell you that fish oil is not good for you. Eating the fish is fine, but fish oil in a capsule form is actually a PUFA. It's very inflammatory. They estimate that 83% of all fish oil is rancid on the shelf before you consume it. Even the best fish oil in the world goes rancid when it mixes with your warm body temperature and stomach acids. And this one study, which I'll show to you, showed fish oil created cell membrane inflammation for four and a half months. This was taken from the book, The PEO Solution, page 251. It takes 18 weeks to reverse the negative effect of the incorporation of EPA and DHA from fish oil into the cell membrane. Crazy. How do I know olive oil is not cut? I'll share with you the company that I use. They're called the Fresh Pressed Olive Oil Club. You could actually get a $39 bottle of their olive oil for one buck if you go to ketocampoliveoil.com. Alina will drop that in the, in the notes. They're not cut. I vetted them. I've interviewed them. They support local farmers. It's fresh. It's first pressed, so it's loaded with more antioxidants and polyphenols. Uh, so it's ketocampoliveoil.com. You could get a $39 bottle for one buck. They are clean and terrific. But you could also do the olive oil test. Here's how you know. Go If you have olive oil in your pantry, take a shot of it and then see what happens. If you take a shot and it goes down smooth, no burning, you just it goes down smooth, that's a red flag. You want olive oil to burn your throat, make your tongue fuzzy, maybe even make you cough. That means it's a good one. It's called the olive oil test. This study showed DHA, so fish oil, lowers cardiac mitochondrial activity. Not good. This study showed Fish oil is linked to increased risk of colon cancer in mice. Here's the quote. We found that mice develop deadly late-stage colon cancer when given high doses of fish oil, she said. More importantly, with the increased inflammation, it took only four weeks for the tumors to develop. You're thinking, yeah, but I don't take high-dose fish oil. I should be fine. Here's the thing. The human brain, an adult human brain, according to the National Institutes of Health, only requires 7.2 milligrams of EPA and DHA every day. One capsule of fish oil is 1,000 milligrams of EPA and DHA on average. That is a super physiological overdose. Don't consume fish oil. I'll give you alternatives in a second. Krill oil is a little bit better. It's protected by the astaxanthin, but I still don't take or recommend crystal krill oil. Here's what we do. Here's what I teach my Keto Camp Academy students to replace fish oil with pure form. We're actually going to be giving away 13 bottles of pure form this week. Eat wild caught salmon or get systemic formulas, Vista one and two, or something called Andrea seed oils. You can find all of that over at ketocampsupplements.com. Ketocampsupplements.com. Next thing to consider is this, your liver. Your liver is the soccer mom organ. I call your liver the soccer mom organ because the liver does everything just like a soccer mom. One of the responsibilities for the liver is to produce bile. Bile is liquid gold. Bile breaks down the fat you're eating on keto. Bile also helps you assimilate the fat and it's sent to your cells for energy. Bile also helps with detoxification. But here's the problem. So many of us have beat up our poor soccer mom liver from toxins and medications and alcohol and processed foods and carbohydrates. So now here's what I've seen. And I've taken thousands of thousands of people through a keto protocol, thousands. And I've learned that one of the most common reasons somebody does not feel well on keto or they have digestive issues is because they have sluggish bile. So how do you improve that? Bitters. Everybody type in the chat box right now, bitter for the liver. Type it in, bitter for the liver. So here's a list. This is a good tip for beginners or advanced. Eat any of these bitters every single day on keto. You see the list? Take a screenshot. If you don't have a gallbladder, then go on YouTube and type in Keto Camp Gallbladder and watch my video. We also have a protocol for that in the Keto Camp Academy. But there you go. Bitter for the liver. I see your comments. I love it. I love it. So there you go. Eat those bitters. Bitters for the liver. Now, here's a tip for those who are new to keto. This is only for beginners. How do you get into ketosis in the next seven days? If you're new to keto here, my goal is by day seven, January 16th, to get you in ketosis with zero symptoms. Here's how you're going to do it. 
Number one, follow the 222 rule, which I'll go over. Number two, gradually decrease carbs. Let's unpack those tips. These are only these tips are only for beginners. Keep in mind. So every day, starting today, you want to consume and hit the 2222 rule, which consists of two tablespoons of olive oil or avocado oil, two tablespoons of coconut oil or MCT oil, two tablespoons of butter or ghee, and two teaspoons of sea salt. The question is, how do I have all that fat in one sitting? You're not. You're gonna have. You're gonna spread it throughout the day. You're gonna have it with the f- the oils you cook your food in, salad dressings, dips, coffee, tea, etc. Spread it throughout the day. This is gonna teach your body to start using fatty acids for fuel. At the same time, you're gonna decrease your carbs. The average American is eating about 300 grams of carbs per day. In order to get into ketosis, you gotta drop that below 50 total grams. But I don't recommend doing that day one. We want to do that by day seven. So a gradual decrease. You're going to track your carbohydrates with Chronometer. We love Chronometer. This is a free app. If you go to chronometer.com slash keto camp, let's say you're consuming 300 grams of carbs per day. Then starting tomorrow, you go down to 250 grams. The next day down to 200 grams, so on and so forth until your upper limit is no more than 50 grams of carbs per day. And I want you to get there by day seven. So go at your own pace, but you won't know how much you're having unless you track it. So your homework assignment for beginners is to track it. Get that app. It's free. Here's a keto pro tip. This is for beginners and for those advanced. We want to remove spinach and almonds. I know you're killing, I'm killing you here because it's in so many keto foods, but spinach and almonds. Yes, you could use car manager, any app, Jason, any app is fine. Spinach and almonds are high amount or have high amounts of oxalates. Oxalates are anti-nutrients and for a lot of people can be inflammatory. So I'm not saying to avoid these forever, but I've seen just removing these and replacing these can make a big difference with inflammation. So you want to replace your almonds with walnuts, pecans, Brazil nuts, peely nuts, and macadamia nuts. With Brazil nuts, don't have more than four or five per day. You don't want too much selenium. Just make sure you do that. And then with spinach, replace that with arugula, dandelion greens, broccoli, or Brussels sprouts. And then cow dairy, another pro tip. I know, I know, I know. I'm sorry. Don't shoot the messenger. It's estimated that 75% of adults in the world cannot process pasteurized cow dairy, meaning it could be inflammatory. You don't even know it. So replace pasteurized cow dairy with sheep dairy, goat dairy, macadamia nut milk, coconut milk, or with raw dairy is fine. The problem with spinach and the problem with almonds and almond milk is that it has too many oxalates. Oxalates are anti-nutrients that create inflammation in the gut. That's the problem. Here are other hidden sources of inflammation on keto. Legumes like peanut, peanut butter, hummus, um, garbanzo beans, Corn is typically GMO. Soy, typically GMO. Burning your protein is not a good idea. A lot of farm fish could be bad. And nightshades like eggplants, goji berries, and tomatoes. Yes, that's fine, Belinda. Artificial sweeteners. A lot of keto products are loaded with artificial sweeteners. We want to avoid the following that you see here. Maltitol, sorbitol, mannitol, aspartame, sucralose. We're going to focus on sucralose because that and aspartame because that one is most popular. This study showed, a human study, how sucralose from Splenda moved through the body. At the end of the study, and yes, sheep and goat could be pasteurized. That's fine. At the end of the study, they determined that only three, uh, excuse me, 96.7% of it was traceable. 3.3% of it was untraceable. Where is it going? Is it turning into an unusual metabolite or is it bioaccumulating in the body somewhere? Uh, We don't know. This study looked at 17 obese women and it showed sucralose did raise glucose and insulin levels in some, but not in others. So it's going to be very different for each individual. This study published in the journal, excuse me, in Nature 2014 showed what happened. uh, So it showed that artificial sweeteners induced glucose intolerance by altering the gut microbiota, changing the gut microbiome in a negative way. Not good. These studies show Splenda could cause weight gain, affect your gut bacteria, and cooking with it is bad. So switch to these. 
Monk fruit, stevia, erythritol, swerve. I would also add xylitol into the mix. These are much better. Make that swap. It'll go a long way. So here is your day one action steps. And then we're going to get to our next giveaway and VIP Q&A. Day one action steps. Every day you're going to get a set of action steps. If you're watching on YouTube, you got to sign up for the challenge. It's free. Go to ketocampchallenge.com. So if you're a beginner, you're going to follow that 2222 rule starting today. I will email you and post in the Facebook group with what that entails in case you didn't have time to write it down. Everybody, not just beginners, but advanced, I want you to conduct an audit in your kitchen and eliminate those bad fats and artificial sweeteners that we outlined. Everybody, not just beginners, but everybody, replace cow dairy, almonds, and spinach. Beginners, you're going to start reducing your carbs each day. Number five, everybody, I want you to write down your why. Get clear on it. Write it, uh, write it down and keep it in front of you. Number six, everybody do an audit, the chargers versus drainers experiment that we talked about and spend time with the, the chargers. And number seven, go listen to the Keto Camp podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, you could still join the rest of the challenge. If you go to ketocampchallenge.com, you could join. So get signed up for it because I'm about to stop the YouTube stream and you're not going to be able to see any of the other sessions. So YouTube, if you're watching this on YouTube, go to ketocampchallenge.com or click the link in the notes below. YouTube, thanks for watching. Appreciate you all. I'm signing off of YouTube. Love and appreciate you all on YouTube. On the challenge here, we're not done. So don't sign off. That was just for YouTube.